Is there no end to this endless icy desolation where nothing grows? This white empty void. Antarctica appears to be like the Einsteinian model of the universe we've been taught. Infinite. The former seems to be more likely than the latter, judging by the last month we've spent here. They were lucky today with the weather, once again. A stretch of lucky days and lucky nights by Antarctic standards. For five days now, they had journeyed onwards without facing any major hurdles in their way. They slept well and kept on walking, ever walking. On the fifth day, the hopeful trend was still unbroken. They slept through the night without even the slightest disturbance from winter weather. Well rested and fed, they were ready to fight another day. Let's put the tent pieces in the sled and get going. The sun is up, John. And you know what they say. Make hay while the sun still shines. John rose to the task and packed the tent up in a record pace. This is something to tell the grandkids after all of this mayhem I've been through. I went to Antarctica to find the ends of the earth, and I became an expert at setting up tents. Small beginnings and all that. It's packed. We're ready. Shall we? We shall, said William, and he took the lead, while John pulled the sled from behind. They had decided to switch around their previous sled detail formula. Instead of changing after each day, they would now change every fourth hour to maximize their potential. They knew they had to walk a long way yet, and the load had to be shared equally. If there's a hot pursuit for us, they better gear up. We're not giving in. They waded through the snow in silence, and John missed the sounds of nature. The chirping of birds would be a start. John, do you know who we should have brought along with us on this expedition? I don't. Whom? Eddie Bravo. You know who that is? The Jiu-Jitsu master. Yes, I know of him, and his interest in this subject. That time when he took on Joe Rogan. Ah. It was, as the kids say these days, epic. He'll be over the moon, if we prove him right. Ha, I don't doubt it. We owe it to him. I'd like to see him vindicated in public. The guy was one of the first who spoke out about this, yes. Yeah, said William. As William deployed the tent that night, John went through what was left in the sled. Despite nicking all of their supplies, the food and water's about to run out. For real this time. We have food and water for four or five days more. Six tops, he growled. Then let us seize the day and take advantage of these last couple of days, said William calmly. They walked, and they walked. Their fighting spirit was high, but they started to notice a slight change in the terrain. The layer of snow on the plains had begun to deepen, and their walking pace was severely slowed down as a result. They now had to struggle wading through the snow, and at times the both of them had to pull the sled. Does it ever end, God? Does it? It has to end. Everything has an end. If there is a beginning, there must be an end. What goes up must come down. At the end of the day, when they had trudged through a particularly rough ice glacier, they paid notice to something peculiar. The sun was setting much earlier than the day before. It was William who noticed the anomaly. Are you sure it set earlier today? What time is it exactly? William looked at his wristwatch. It's four o'clock sharp. Strange. I could have sworn that the sunset occurred at 4.20 only yesterday. Hang on. How is this possible? We are into early May right now, sure. And the Antarctic winter is coming, when it will be completely dark here for many months. But now? It's too early. It doesn't make a lick of sense. They kept trudging through the wide inferno the next day, but an insight about as comforting as a wet blanket began to crystallize itself for the pair. Our storage is as good as empty. Even if we would starve ourselves, this will last for three days more at best. What the hell have we been doing? Why didn't we plan for this when we escaped a month since Scott? We should have brought more. Much more. But hindsight is 2020 after all. No reason to cry about it now. Onward, we go. John pulled the sled this time around while William led the way with a compass in his left hand and the camera tripod stick in his right. Whatever would happen from here on out, they did know one thing, their course was straight as an arrow. Not for one second did they allow for any mistakes to happen on that front. As morning turned into afternoon, a pattern began to emerge. The same phenomenon in the skies happened today. The sun's going down, see. But it's just half past three. Why is the sun setting a half an hour earlier today? It makes. It makes no sense. Can you make sense of this, said William and turned around to John. What could it mean? Not only is the sunset taking place 30 minutes earlier than yesterday, it looks weird. Yeah. 
the sun appears to be smaller in angular size, and the color of it seems to be paler, not as brightly yellow as we are used to. I can't remember ever recalling the sun appearing like this in the sky. What could it mean? What could it mean? I have no clue, honestly. It doesn't make any sense, said John. Hang on. I've got it. I might just have solved it. Could it because of? Could it? Could it really be so? Let's wait and see before I get my hopes up. Whatever the case may be with the sun, it is not fully set. Let's fight until the night is upon us, shouted John. William grunted a boar-like guttural sound that John interpreted as a yes. Well, he is pulling the damned sled after all. Can't blame him for not being all chitty chatty. They kept walking toward south until taking another step in the snow was another impossibility, as the sunset had come and gone, and there was not even a hint of light to be found. Not even moonlight came to their rescue. They had not seen the moon for days, and this night was not an exception. Jesus Christ William. The amount of sunlight we've been getting these past days, the sun's only up for a couple of hours. What time is it right now? 3 o'clock sharp. Again, 30 minutes earlier than the day before. If this keeps going, we'll be in total darkness within just a matter of days. What is this? William shrugged. I don't have the foggiest, John. I'm as confused as you are. The Antarctic winter is coming, but it is more than a whole month away, and it sure as hell should not be escalating this quickly. Could it be that the sun is behaving anomalous because we are at the very far ends of the earth, and therefore we see the apparent position of the sun being projected differently? I don't know John. I don't know. I am at a loss for words. The next day followed the trend to a T. The sun went down a whole hour earlier than before. It's two o'clock, and it's nearly gone, said William. How, um, how many miles have we walked today, do you think? It's hard to say, said William and squinted towards the very last rays of sunlight cast over them. It looks weird, doesn't it? It looks fainter, not as bright as it appears to be back home, or even in Australia. Or even at a Munson Scott, for that matter. We must have come to a place on Earth that radiates electromagnetic anomalies. I thought I was the only one, said John in agreement. The sun looks so... I don't know, eerie. Very eerie. While we are at anomalies, did you notice that the snow layer wasn't as deep as it was yesterday? Maybe my mind's playing tricks on me, but today I felt like trudging through the snow wasn't as cumbersome. It felt like an easier walk today. Was it? Asked William. I drifted away today. I was miles away. I was letting my mind wander off back to easier times. Christmas dinner at Ulrich Stell. It's like they say, you know. What do people say? All of man's troubles comes from his inability to sit quietly in a room by himself. John laughed. Maybe because that'd be quite a dull life. We are hardwired to seek adventure and overcome hurdles. Solving problems. It's in our nature, our DNA. I know my friend. I was just saying. Yeah. So, you don't believe that my observation holds any water, asked John. What observation? That the terrain is changing. The snow layer isn't nearly as thick as it was before. We'll see if my theory is proven right by the morning. I think it's getting warmer and that the snow is melting. For whatever reason. We may be walking into an area that is more tempered. Warmer. Warmer. Oh John. You're clutching at straws here, I fear. I mean, I'd love for your wishful thinking to be true, but I remain skeptical. Just because the snow air is an inch less thick doesn't mean much. At least not until we see some real evidence. Why are you so gloom and doom all of a sudden? I just told you that it's getting warmer and that the terrain is getting easier to navigate by the day. Why don't you at least think about it, consider it as a possibility? I am thinking about it. I am considering all possible scenarios for how this journey will end for us, and there is one way out we can take if all goes to hell, and we are facing a slow, agonizing last couple of days here in the cold with no food or water. I suppose we could start eating snow before we eat one another, but that still wouldn't exactly work in the long term. Sadhu's pistol is in the sled. I wrapped it in a couple of blankets at the very bottom, but it's there. I only fired one round of his Glock, which means that there are five or even ten bullets left in the mag. If push comes to shove, we only need two bullets. Do you catch my drift John? John stared at him with a worried look. Yeah, I'm not stupid. I get it. But that should be our plan B, C, or D. When all hope is lost, we might consider that. But not right now. Okay. I have hope. I feel hopeful about this. 
Hope that we can make it out of this alive. A fool's hope. Maybe so. And you'll get your hopes up too, soon enough. I know these things. They spent the rest of the day covered up inside the tent, and sat for the most part in complete silence. It was pitch black outside, and it felt like it was an eternity ago, when they saw the sun. They went to sleep, and when they woke up the following morning it was still black as night outside. Finally, at around 10 o'clock in the morning, the sun reared her face to them. They packed up the tent and prepared to leave. John put his hand on William's shoulder. Come on now. We are not done yet. To the last breath. Do you know what I'd like to do right now John? No. What would that be? Get high as a kite, or amped up on some other drug. I should have brought some from Australia. During our last day in Perth, I should have made sure to get us a masset or the like. The Aussies love drugs, and it's easy to attain, if you know where to look. It'd be a perfect time to take it now. If we are going to die, why not go out with a smile on our faces? Shut up you. Dropping acid out here might have been fun for an hour or two, but I can guarantee you that we would jeopardize everything, and we'd likely never wake up the next morning. We'd just keel over in the snow and be unceremoniously buried here in the middle of nowhere, and our bodies would never be found. That's not going to happen, okay? Now we go forward. To the last breath. All right John. I'm with you. There's strength in me left. John pulled the sled, and William carried the compass, and dragged the tripod stick. Again, John felt a remarkable change in the terrain. It's real. It's not imaginary. This is a piece of cake. I'm floating through this. It's barely any snow here to talk of. Not only that, I'm not even cold anymore. Hell, I think I'm even sweating. And there's not a cloud to be seen, not a breeze to be felt. William? Are you seeing this? Feeling this? I haven't gone crazy. I was right. William knelt by the snow and grasped a handful. I'll be damned. You are right goddammit. The terrain really is getting easier to walk. And it's not even. It's not even cold. I don't feel chilly in the slightest. I told you as much. They looked up at the sun, which appeared in the sky as a tiny pinprick of pale yellow light. The sun had only been up for about two hours, but it had nearly set again. It's almost gone completely, for crying out loud. The time? Shouted John. 12.15. Jesus goddamn Christ. No, I'm not going to set up camp after just two hours. Let's continue. William spun around and stared at him. Keep going. How? In just half an hour from now we won't even be able to see our own hands. How could we keep going, with a sled no less, when we'll stumble around like drunken village idiots? We'll figure it out. I'm not going to throw the very last day we have provisions, to sit on our asses immobile and munch away the very last of our scraps. Who knows when we'll see the sun again, if this pattern continues. He walked towards the sled and rummaged through it ferociously. I need to start a fire. I need to make light. There. There's something down there. Yes. Yes. He found the very last cache of the firewood, which consisted of two large logs, and unsheathed his knife. He began carving the logs. What the hell are you doing? Are you sculpting? I'm carving the wood. Torches, they're supposed to be, I hope. Torches. Yes, torches. Ever heard of them? Stubborn as he was, he ignored William's cynical cries that ranged from waste of time to you don't even know what you are doing. He carved the logs until they were thin enough to hold in one hand and went back to the sled in search of the paraffin lamp they had used the nights before. He emptied the contents of the lamp and poured the kerosene lamp oil over the logs and smeared it gently with the help of a blanket. He took out a matchbox from the sled and lit it up and slowly placed the match just above the oil-drenched log. Come on now. This is going to work. This will work. You will catch fire. You will. The log heard his plea and ignited into flame with a thousand red sparks bursting out of it. He put the second log next to the burning one and the latter caught fire as well. Ha! I did it. We have two working torches now. He carried the torches with both hands and handed one over to William. No more excuses now. We are walking and we don't stop unless the Grim Reaper himself shows up and cuts us down. Let's move. William was shaken and stirred, but he nodded after what appeared to be a moment of inner contemplation. Onwards they went with the torches and John was surprised how well they worked. They provide just enough light for a decent field of vision ahead. They walked through the dark with their torches guiding the way. 
William took the lead with John pulling the sled with his right hand and carried the torch with his left. What would have been nigh impossible only days before, dragging along a big bulky cart with one hand, went surprisingly well. There's barely any snow on the ground to wade through anymore. I can walk through this about as easily as taking a stroll in the park on a winter's day. Or a summer's day, more like. Do I even need to wear my coat any longer? John unbuttoned his coat, and to his surprise the warmth he thought he felt seeping through his body was not imagined. It doesn't only feel temperate. It's a whole other type of feeling. A soothing warmth tingling through my spine. What is this sorcery? They had not walked for more than an hour when John suddenly halted. He felt something under his boots, something other than ice or snow. Being used to the crunching sound of jamming his boots on snow for a whole month, he instantly recognized that there was something afoot with the terrain. He put down the sled and went down on his knees and gasped. Grass. Blades of grass. Is this an illusion? Like in those old swashbuckler movies, when the hero has walked through the desert for so long that he is starting to lose his mind and he begins to project imaginary things, like a fresh pool of water. Could this really be grass, or have I been here for so long that I can't even recognize it? He removed his gloves and unearthed a handful of green straws from the ground. William, he cried, as William had kept walking and didn't hear him stop. William. Stop. Look down, on the ground. He laughed out loud for himself and waved the blades of grass in front of William, who came hurrying back. William knelt by the ground and lowered his torch to the vegetation. William's torch licked the straws and one of the blades caught fire and burned to a crisp. Definitely and unquestionably grass. William rose up slowly with a frantic look on his face. John, my dear friend. I think. You did it. No, we did it, my beloved companion. I don't know whether we'll live long enough to tell the tale, but I think we might be close, very close, to discovering something monumental," he said, and he walked up to John and embraced him. John hugged him back tightly. I think so too. Let's push onwards. Just a little bit longer. A little bit. Come on. Re-energized by their discovery, they quickened up the pace and marched faster than ever before. John noticed that the terrain started shifting dramatically, while it was still pitch black, and the same old plain desolation all around them for as far as the eye could see, they guessed that, if they could see through the thick of it, the landscape would be different than before. Only small strips of snow now covered the ground, what they walked now seemed to be a grassy knoll or the like. One thing is certain. We are no longer walking on tundra, glacier, nor a snowy heath. This is different. This place is special. As they kept their course steady in the darkness and marched ever onwards. John waved his torch around in all directions, eager to discover something new. As he once again lowered his torch to ground level, he saw something colorful flash by. What was that? He crouched by the unidentified object that sprang out of the ground. He placed the light by the plant and ripped it out from the earth. A flower. It's beautiful. Of what kind, I have no idea. Maybe I should have become a florist instead of an adventurer for a living. The flower was strikingly elegant and had a green stalk and its petals were purple. He looked underneath the petals and saw that it was blue underneath. He held on to it gently and gawked around him in amazement. What is this place we have come to? This Garden of Eden, hidden in plain sight. He showed the flower to William, who in turn had found a flower of his own. A scarlet orchid-like flower. William just stared at him with an empty look. What is this place? Where are we John? Could this? Could this be the place Admiral Byrd discovered 60 years ago? I really have no clue. No clue. But I'm liking these early signs, I'll tell you that much. But we have to keep on moving. Our torches will burn out in an hour or two. John pocketed the flower in his inner coat sleeve and picked himself up with hope in his heart. For the first time, since they left Amundsen Scott, they were now walking downhill. They walked through the darkness with their dying torches. Twenty minutes left. Thirty tops. We have to make it before the lights go out. The slope was followed by a steep uphill terrain. Now John fought for his very life as he carried both the dying torch and the sled. They went up, up, up. Ever upwards. Are we striding up a mountain? He lit up the ground by his feet and saw that his boots stood on a rocky surface. He touched a stone mound to confirm his suspicions. We are at the foot of a mountain, or a cliff, from what it seems. 
The mountain slope began to feel almost impossible to walk as it became steeper for every step they took. The higher up they got, the harder it was for them to balance themselves. John began to realize that one misstep would be the end of him. If he would slip and fall, he would descend hundreds of feet below in darkness and break his neck, no doubt. Sweat came pouring down his face as he grunted and dragged the sled upwards, fueled by sheer power of will. William? Come back here and help me. I can no longer carry this monstrosity on my own. Push. They both pulled with sheer brute force as the rock they walked steeped even more. Soon we'll be climbing up a vertical hill, if this beast of a mountain will keep sloping like this. If we fall now, we'll die. No ifs or buts about it. And we don't have any grapple hooks, so be kind on us, God. We're so close. John raised his torch above his head and saw what was ahead. A plateau. We just have to make up there. Just a few more steps. A few more steps. They threw their torches away, in order to thrust the sled from behind with their full potential, one final push. Fight. A bit more. Just some more William. Nearly there. With the greatest push they had ever made in either of their lives, they managed to lift the sled up on the plateau, and they rested for a while, before climbing up on it themselves. John grabbed hold of the stony mountainside, and heaved himself up to the plateau. And was nearly blinded as a result by the most intense rays of light he had ever seen. He wiggled around on the rocky plateau, and rose to his feet slowly. Holy Mother of God. The sun is up again. How? How could? It was then, in that moment, that John understood. All the pieces came together as he shut his eyes, and tried to visualize that image William had showed him a long time ago. We are in another pocket. Another pond, another crater. An adjacent earth crater. With another sun. A different sun than ours. So it must be. It has to be. Oh my god. Oh my god. John's eyes had been so busy gazing at the sun, that he had yet to marvel over the landscape that spread out underneath him below the mountain. He saw the tallest trees he had ever seen as he overlooked an enormous forested area that spread out for miles, as far as the eye could see. William breathed a sigh of relief when he finally made his way up to the plateau and saw the same unearthly sight. The sweat came pouring from the cheeks of his friend, and he ripped his winter clothes off and threw them on the ground. William just sat there and looked at the view. John, old friend. I think we did it. I think we just did it, he cried, exhausted beyond words. John walked up to him and placed his right hand on William's shoulder. William, you son of a bitch. You mischievous, unconventional, son of a bitch. You sly bastard. You were right all along. You were right. We found a world beyond our own. There is no doubt. There is no doubt. Just look at it. I just wish folks back home could see us now and see what we see right here. Oh, how I wish. How I wish they could see. This new world better have some kind of food to offer, or a McDonald's, because I want to live to tell the tale of this place," said William, and he laid himself to rest on his back as they bathed in the blinding light of the new sun. We'll rest here for a short while and regain our strength. Then we'll climb down the plateau, slide our way down the mountain, and head into this forest. I don't need to rest, nor do I need to sleep for that matter," said William and rose to his feet on shaky legs. I need food and water. In case you forgot, we ran out yesterday morning. I am familiar, said John. There might be nutrition to find in this forest. Who knows? Berries, mushrooms, even wild game. You still have that gun, right? I sure do, John. I'm not a hunter, and I doubt very much that a Glock is the first choice when shooting wild game for food, but I guess it'll have to do. I'm not a hunter either, but Sadu's pistol should be adequate enough to take down a deer or a moose with a steady arm and a good aim, said John. Sure thing. Oh boy. This place. I haven't felt this good in body and soul since we were in Australia, disregarding the hunger issues. Are you sure we just didn't freeze to death on the way here, and our souls wandered off into paradise? Maybe this is some kind of limbo, or purgatory. A purgatory without, you know, the painful parts. Ha! I saw loss too. Now quit yapping. Let's go find us some food. They slid down the mountainside with relative ease. The slope was not nearly as steep here as it was on the side of the mountain they came from, where they fought like beasts to even gain an inch. They walked downwards and ferried the sled, which landed with a clunk on the leaf-covered ground at the foot of the mountain. 
William bent over backwards by the sled and unloaded two items from the cargo. The black lock pistol belonging to the late Jacques Adu and the dire wolf pin needle he had worn prior to the pandemonium at Amundsen's cot. He pinned the brooch on his sweater and held the pistol in his right hand. For safety. Well I do hope there's game in this forest that we could kill, we might also run into unsavory characters here. I mean, everything is off the charts now. We know for an utmost fact now that this is indeed a deception of unspeakable magnitude, so there'll be folks nearby, I have no doubt. And that silly brooch you are wearing from that show. Throne of Games? The Lord of the Rings copy. Is that also for safety, or just a harbinger of luck? William grunted. Shush. They commenced their walk through the thick, exotic, jungle-like forest, and they began to pick up rare scents and strange aromas in the air. They found it hard to adjust to the surreal new terrain. After freezing for a whole month, they now faced the polar opposite. The trees were enormous, bigger than any tree John had ever laid eyes on in real life. Beech, alder, and maple trees sprang from the ground, towering over them with their majestic crowns blotting out the sunlight almost completely. Their gnarly tree stumps looked to his eyes, as if they were thousands of years old, ancient giants that had stood firm from when the earth itself was formed. Reminds me of the Malern trees from Lothlorien, or perhaps even the Fangorn forest from Tolkien's Legendarium. As they walked under the giant trees in awe, John suddenly heard strange noises from afar. Screeching, cawing sounds echoed from beyond the trees. John halted and tried his best to spot where the sounds could be coming from. Don't stop, said William, who pulled the sled. We go straight through. There's a path here, and we'll follow it. We don't know where it leads, but it has to be better than just heading out into that wilderness with no plan. You're right. We'll follow this pathway and see where it leads us. The air felt thicker than ever before, and they almost had to gasp for breath every five minutes. On the right side of the pathway, a titan emerged from the ground that caught their eyes. It was the most incredible, awe-inspiring tree John had ever seen. A humongous chestnut tree stood before them, with its broad stump that stretched tens of feet wide. Its branches gnarled in every direction. Holy smokes, said William. We really are in a place out of this world. This chestnut tree has to stand at least 300 feet tall. I only know of one place in the world where trees grow to a size that could even begin to rival this colossus, and those are the sequoia trees in California. Redwood, I think they are called. But this, this is a chestnut, said John. He walked slowly towards the giant tree and placed his hands gently on its stub. It feels like touching an ancient relic. It's as if my hands are grasping the holy grail itself. This tree, this whole forest, feels so sacred and precious. It's as if I'm walking through the nature equivalent of the Vatican archives. Suddenly, the strange noises came back to haunt them. Cawing, screeching, growling noises blew through them from behind the great chestnut tree. What on earth could produce such a sound? From nowhere, a creature emerged from behind the tree line. A large, violet-colored bird circled around them both and cawed until the ostrich-like creature froze at the foot of the chestnut tree. The bird's beak was white and its plumage had shades of beige in it. From the back of his head, he saw a sudden movement by William. He had raised a pistol and aimed it at the creature. No. Don't shoot, for heaven's sake. We don't know this area. We don't have a clue what else could be lurking in the shadows. Don't be a fool. I'm starving John. We need to risk it, whether you like it or not. Don't do it. Remember that we could be person one, two, three shots boom through the forest. The sound of gunfire echoed through the trees for what felt like an eternity. William walked up to his prey and investigated it. Bull's eye. Thank the gods for that John. It's worth it. We have to eat. We can't make it another day without food. John drew a deep breath and sighed, still shocked over how long the sound of gunfire had rippled through the forest. I bet they heard that from 20 miles away. William went to the sled and brought out the small knife they had used for carving logs and began skinning the bird. How the hell are we going to eat that thing, cried John. We lead it raw. Just as William was about to shove the knife deep into the dead bird's intestines, a roar echoed through the woods. The sound of a hurricane. Or worse. He looked up and tried to see the sky above, but he could only catch small glimpses as the monstrous tree crowns provided so much cover that it almost felt like looking at a ceiling. Judging by the tiny cracks in the ceiling, the sky had not changed. The sun was shining bright and its rays splayed through the cracks of the tree crowns. There was not a cloud to be seen. 
What do you think it was? Asked William nervously. He held the knife in hand and had paused his skinning session. Whatever it was, it can't be good. I don't think that sound was a force of nature. The noise is even louder now. Humming sounds from somewhere in the forest. They're getting closer. It sounds like the noise of a thousand engines. Are they coming at us with tanks or the like? Out of nowhere, a most prepotent ensemble showed up. Through the trees, ten armored jeeps raced out from the woods and encircled them at the forest pathway. They found themselves surrounded within a matter of just seconds. John and William just stood there, aghast. There's no point in even trying to run away from this. One needs to realize when the game's over, and that time is now. The doors flung up, and soldiers in military uniforms rushed out of the armored cars. The soldiers were heavily armed with automatic rifles, and they were now all pointed at the pair of them. John knew enough about guns to recognize what type of firearm they were carrying. Some of the most ruthlessly efficient of their kind. Most of them carried M401, while the others pointed what looked like HK416 guns directly at him. William dropped his knife to the ground, and they both held their arms up high. It's over now. Whatever clandestine agency is running the show here, these are the foot soldiers. The pawns. Their uniforms were colored in gray, and they all wore helmets. John and William were forced to their knees with their hands still pointed towards the sky. John looked at the armada of trigger-happy men with rifles, pointed their way and noticed something on the soldier closest to him. There was a sewed-on patch on his chest in blue and white. He instantly recognized a symbol, and when he looked around he noticed that every single one of them had the very same patch on their uniforms. It is the emblem of the United Nations. The azimuthal equidistant projection. Oh my god. Right. It's their official flag, for crying out loud. How did that slip under my radar? They've been telegraphing this the whole time, all these years. Hiding in plain sight, flaunting it to the unaware sheep. The United Nations is in league with NASA and the rest of the conspirators. Everything makes sense now. It all falls into place. The map is even divided into 33 Masonic sections. All that could be heard was the wailing of the wind blowing through the trees. The soldiers did not speak a word, and it was as silent as the grave. Suddenly, John heard how the back door of one of the jeeps slammed open, and a tall man in black suit and sunglasses walked towards them slowly with resolute, determined steps. He appeared to be in his late thirties and emanated a vile, menacing vibe. He unveiled the holster on his belt, drew his pistol up in the air, cocked it, and pointed it at them both. Are you armed? He roared with a clear American accent. Well? I'm not going to ask again. I am, said William. I have a gun in my pocket. The man in charge now aimed his pistol right at William's heart. Remove it, carefully, and throw it ten feet ahead of you. William obeyed and threw Sadu's Glock in front of him. The man walked forward and picked up the pistol. William Milton and John Willander. You are under arrest. The United Nations police will keep you under custody for now. Under what charge? Aren't you going to give us the Miranda rights? Cried William. The man laughed. This is not America child. And I need not delve into what you are being arrested for. You'll have plenty of time to reflect upon what you have done when you are in safe keeping. All right, sir. But I can assure you. We can assure you. We will have our own attorney if this comes to trial. We can afford it. You can count on that, punk. The man ordered his squadron to handcuff and blindfold them both, and they were quickly ushered into separate cars. John squirmed in the back of the car, out of breath and out of sight. The engine of the SUV started, and off they went. Where the hell are they taking me? Seven point six billion people call Earth their home. You are now two out of approximately five thousand individuals who know the truth. Even fewer have actually seen it with their own eyes like you have. And you have seen but a sliver of it, know this. You haven't even peeled off the outermost layer of the onion, said Colin Vance, director of the United Nations Security Council. Vance had the look on his face of a rugged, embittered hermit. John and William did not reply, so he continued. Look around you. There are no high-profile politicians in this room. Donald Trump is not present. Vladimir Putin is not here. Xi Jinping is not here. Nor is Justin Trudeau, Angela Merkel, Theresa May, Narendra Modi, or Shinzo Abe. These men and women of power did not decide to not grace themselves with their presence because they consider this business unimportant. No. 
they are not present because they are blissfully unaware. Just like the vast majority of the population of Earth. Some truths are of such magnitude that they cannot be shared, not even with those who imagine themselves wielding ultimate power. You now know of a secret that 5,000 people, I'm sorry, I mean 5,002, out of 7.6 billion humans on Earth know. The secret that we don't live where we've been told that we live. The atmosphere was tense in the damp bunker they were being held. Underneath the United Nations headquarters, deep below the area commonly known as Turtle Bay in Midtown New York, they were questioned in front of a large audience. John and William kept their mouths shut once again. After their capture in the lush rainforest beyond Antarctica, they were flown out of an airfield nearby the very same day and arrived in Buenos Aires some 10 hours later. Upon their arrival to Argentina, they were under constant surveillance and still in cuffs. After a three-hour layover they were taken to a connecting flight to New York and brought directly to the United Nations headquarters. They had not slept for 37 hours and they had only been fed scraps of food and one glass of water at the Buenos Aires airport. They had an airfield down there. A military base. Even a church and a post office no less. I was unlucky to just catch a glimpse of that settlement when I managed to remove the blindfold for a couple of seconds, but the guards put it back on almost straight away. Had I managed to see more. Jesus. They are building a colony down there. A new state. Is that the motive, when it all comes down to it? Simple greed, making a buck for a few acres of land in areas the public doesn't know of. William Milton tried desperately to wriggle his hands out of the cuffs and squirmed in his seat. Knowing that it was to no avail, he decided to speak out instead. We did not come to Antarctica and beyond to acquire a membership card to your exclusive club. We searched for the truth. He spoke to Vance and all the folks around him in the dimly lit bunker. They were 33 in total, including Vance. They were representatives for the UN, NASA, JAXA, Roscosmos, ESA, ISRO, CNSA. On the far right sat two women who, judging by the emblems they wore on their suits, represented Elon Musk SpaceX and Richard Branson's Virgin Galactic, respectively. Even SpaceX is in on it. How could I have been so naive to think that Musk was an independent power player in the space industry? SpaceX is funded by the American government after all. Congress gave them $5 billion last year, or was it even six? Musk is but a puppet, it all makes sense. His irrational behavior and his obscure promises about the future with hotels on asteroids and Mars colonies. He is but a pawn, and he doesn't have a clue what's going on. But Virgin Galactic? They haven't accomplished a thing. Other than spreading empty promises about space tourism around in the media for a decade or two. Ah, the truth. Aren't you quite the boy scout, said Colin Vance in a fatigued tone of voice. Colin Vance was an African American in his late fifties. Judging by his accent, he was from the Deep South. He was nearly bald and sported black mustache so remarkable that it reminded John of Agatha Christie's character Hercule Poirot, the Belgian detective. The truth. The truth can be adjusted and modified. Especially when it gets in the way of the greater good. Do you get what I mean? They did not reply. Agent Maluselli. A beast of a man who appeared to be of South American origin waddled slowly towards the table separating Vance from John and William, placed a Polaroid photograph in front of Vance, and lumbered back to his earlier guarding position with his arms crossed. Vance mumbled something half-hearted that sounded like thank you, and flipped the photograph over. He slid the photograph slowly over to John and William. Do you know this man? John eyed the photo closely and recognized the iconic facial features of one Jacques Sadou. Only the face is familiar though. The Canadian's eyes were wide open and his corpse rested on a bed of red-colored snow. This photograph was taken by one of our men in the field, Sergeant Alexei Larionov. It clearly depicts a certain Jacques Olivier Laurent Sadou out of Quebec, Canada. From what we have gathered, this man was your companion. What happened? Why did you kill him? Who fired that lethal round in his chest? Neither of them replied. John looked down at his feet, and William looked wistfully up in the ceiling as Vance, and his 32 disciples kept staring at them. Neither of you did the deed. Oh, well. No matter. Our private investigation team will find out soon enough. And even if they don't, know that we will pin this on the both of you, whether you did it or not. You stand defenseless. You have no more cards left to play. John kept staring at his feet, but William could not take it anymore. His gaze wandered from the ceiling back to Vance and the conspirators behind him. 
He stared at Vance with fire in his eyes. Why Mr. Vance? I know, you know. Well, everyone knows. Everyone knows that our part in this tale is over. John and I will be wiped off the face of the earth soon, so you might as well tell us something that both of us have been quelling over for a very very long time. Why? Why are you people doing this? Why are you conspiring and lying to the humankind? Why are you perpetrating this hoax? You are all despicable irredeemable human beings, and one day, one day, you will pay for it. You will face your creator, and you will feel sorry for what you have done. Karma will catch up to you lot, and justice will be done. Colin Vance leaned back in his chair and studied William with a curious look on his face. The creator. Our creator. You know, not that long ago I would have dismissed any such notion in a heartbeat, threats of God smiting us infidels down. But no longer. You see, I'm a lifelong atheist. Always been. Well, I was. I grew up in Huntsville, Alabama, and went to church every day as a young child. My father did everything he could to turn me into a Bible thumper like the rest, to no avail. He married his high school sweetheart, and they had me shortly thereafter. Eight years later, my mother was pregnant with their second child. Long story short, Mr. Milton, my mother died in childbirth along with my stillborn brother-to-be. My father completely lost his faith in God after that and became an embittered drunkard for the rest of his life. He died of sea roses before he had even turned 50. I grew up in a household that had abandoned faith, Mr. Milton. Are we supposed to sympathize with you people now, just because you have a sob story to throw at us? Van sighed and took a sip of water from the glass in front of him. I've lived the better part of my life with the belief that all of us are the result of a cosmic accident. A bug in the system. A missing link in an indifferent, cold universe. Until about 10 years ago, when I took over the reins from the now retired Cameron Sims. He's still alive. 85 years old he is now, living out his last days at his family ranch in Texas. But that is not important right now. What is important is what I am about to tell you now. Something I think you deserve to hear, even though the pair of you have broken just about every international law there is, and more. You have breached the law, and we will see you punished, and neither of you will ever be free men again. I will grant you this piece of information as a personal courtesy. A gift, if you will. What's the gift, asked John. That there is a God, and everyone you see in this room is sworn to secrecy in relation this truth. We are protecting it. Why? Why are you in cahoots with these people? Why lie to the entire world? Every man, woman, and child, exclaimed John. Vance gave him a hard look. Not only do you look like a child, you ask questions like one. There is no simple, easily digestible answer that I can give you. You lads performed one hell of a journey on foot though. I will grant you that, what you two accomplished is nothing short of extraordinary, you made it further on foot than most men would even dream of. Anyway, why are we lying, you ask. Well, what's your best guess? We have time to spare. I am going out on a limb here, and I'll say that the both of you have discussed this topic to some degree for quite some time. William raised his cuffed hands to his chin and put his elbows on the table. He looked down on his shirt and gently poked the wolf brooch, still pinned to his chest. He laughed to himself, and John could guess why. They took everything we had, and they want to imprison us for life, most like. But they let him keep his ridiculous house stark pin needle to the hearing. No wonder he's laughing. You are right Mr. Vance. We have tried to decipher the motive for a very long time. Personally, in my worst moments, I've boiled it down to a maniacal, psychotic need for control. The kind of need only men of the upper echelons of power positions crave. You, the power elite, control the flow of events and you write the history books. And you have come to the conclusion that we, the plebs of society, if you will, could not handle the truth. You protect a lie that was put into place before you were even born, and yet you defend it. I think you are wrong, Mr. Vance, the truth will out, always. The truth fears no investigation. In my more somber moments, however, I do believe that perhaps you lot are upholding this lie for some kind of an idealistic, utopian purpose. A deception for the greater good. You fear what will happen when the world wakes up. You fear what will happen when the few becomes the many. The truth is dangerous, therefore, the lie is the best alternative. The lesser of two evils. Am I close to the mark, Colin Percival Vance, sneered William defiantly. He slammed his cuffed hands on the table. Vance was taken aback. He looked at William with a nondescript expression on his face. 
I can't tell whether he is impressed or disappointed. Impressed, I suspect. Very good Mr. Milton. You have some wits about you, but I knew that already. You are the son of a great man. When he hears that I am being held captive, I swear, it will be the end don't even bother Mr. Milton. Do you really think we are going to telegraph the real reason as to why you and Mr. Willander are held here? And even if you manage to reach out to him, would he believe you when he hears just how insane your conspiracy theories are? Think a little child. You have lost. William stared with an empty look at the table, and Vance counted that as the sign of a broken, defeated man. He cleared his throat. The lie started some 62 years ago, when Sputnik 1 was to be launched into orbit from Baikonur on October 4, 1957. USA and the Soviet Union had both learned earlier the same year that the cosmology we had all lived by was proven wrong. Thanks to an extraordinary discovery in Antarctica by none another than Admiral Richard Evelyn Byrd, the rules of the game were changed forever. We sat down with the Russians and had intense discussions lasting months about how to deal with the fact that the Earth was proven to be flat. We eventually settled on an agreement. We had to lie. A white lie. We decided to launch a long-term plan and weave a convincing narrative that would fool the world if everything went according to plan. Oh, and when I use the term we, I mean it loosely, of course. Referring to my predecessors. Anyway. Yes. The narrative. The space narrative had to be woven with surgical precision. We had to make a judgment call. Choosing to tell the public the truth and incite mass riots, slaughter, and mayhem on an unprecedented scale, or keep the paradigm going. We chose that the best option was to let them live in their fantasy world, for the sake of world stability. If a truth is too destructive, it should not be told. All the scientific progress that we as humankind had slowly but surely incorporated into our society for millennia would be toppled overnight. Do you realize what would have happened if people were told that we are divinely created? People would run to the churches and pray. Science would lose all credibility and all universities and colleges would shut down. Correct, Mr. Milton. It would be a terrifying sight. Atheism as a worldview would become annihilated, and every single person would bow down and pray to our Lord for mercy. We just can't have the masses turn into religious zealots overnight, can we? When the decision was made, there was no turning back from that point onwards. If a lie becomes big enough, it has to be followed through to the very end. The other superpowers followed our example and formed their fake space programs as a result. We formed NASA, and the Russians installed Ross Cosmos. Let's jump ahead to what happened after Sputnik. Wait, said John. Sputnik was real. They actually sent a craft into orbit. But. How does that work, if of course not? Don't play obtuse. There is no such thing as an orbit, and they sure as hell did not send any craft up there that flew around the Earth like a satellite. It was the first chapter of the space story. The fake launch from Baikonur on that day 62 years ago. Well. That is when the plan kicked into motion for real. Naturally, we had to play along and rile up the media with faux doomsday scenarios of space being dominated by the Soviet Union for the years to come. If the lie is to be convincing, you need to have useful idiots who unknowingly play the part. What happened after Sputnik 1, asked John. Well, that's the part I've scripted the narrative when we, as in the United States of America, take over. Werner von Braun is now the director of NASA, the former Nazi officer who was handpicked in Operation Paperclip by our recruiters. As you might know, we and the Ruskies divided the scientists evenly. Half of them were taken in by us. The other unlucky half was taken to Moscow. I'd say that the most important year since Sputnik is 1962. William turned his gaze away from the table and looked directly into the eyes of Vance. JFK. His speech. Did you guys kill him too? It wouldn't surprise me in the slightest. Lee Harvey Oswald did not act alone. Vance laughed. You have quite the vivid imagination there kid. No, we did not kill Kennedy. But you are right that I was referring to his famed Houston speech. Remember it? Of course I do, said William defiantly. We choose to go to the moon by the end of this decade, he proclaimed. I'm going to assume that JFK was not in the know, so by stating this ultimatum, he unknowingly put the pressure on NASA to have boots on the ground at the moon before 1970. A demand that is impossible to achieve. You are brighter than you look Mr. Milton. I will grant you that. William smiled. 
as you pinpointed with impressive accuracy, the load he places on NASA's shoulders from then on out, forces the agency to speed up their plans. They now had about seven years to orchestrate the most elaborate hoax in human history. A staged event when the human species for the first time in recorded history walk on another celestial body. And it had to work to a T, to sell the fraud to the public. And you faked it. Six times. Vance took a breather and studied the young man closely. The old man was surprised by his antagonist's gumption. Yes. We did. I did not even know of it myself until I took over the reins as acting director of the Security Council. It's an uncomfortable truth, know that. The moon landings had to happen. They needed to be staged, not only to honor JFK's promise. They gave NASA the opportunity to finally take a snapshot of that blue spherical marble we call Earth. Yes, I know what you're thinking. The moon rocks were indeed fake, as they were collected from Antarctica. The telemetry data is all gone for all Apollo missions. They were recorded on a set in Nevada, that much I know. Not exactly our proudest hour, but it needed to be done. We knew all that already. Only gullible morons would ever believe the Apollo missions. You'd be surprised, Mr. Milton. If NASA would make an announcement tomorrow that they found a new exoplanet habituated by flying unicorns and talking pigs, almost everyone would believe it. Do you know why? Because people accept the reality of the world with which we are presented, said William. Exactly. Make the lie big, make it simple, keep saying it. And eventually they will believe it, said William. Vance smiled. Quite so. Especially if you get high priests of society on board. High priests? You mean the scientists, asked Vance. Today's scientists have substituted mathematics for experiments, and they wander off through equation after equation, and eventually build a structure which has no relation to reality. You know your Tesla Mr. Milton. That I do. He was ahead of his time. And he knew. Vance cleared his throat. Perhaps he did. Now, let me continue. After the moon missions came the space shuttle program. The next step. You see, we had to weave a narrative with a false sense of progress in the public's eye. After the clunky rockets of the 60s, entered the top modern space shuttles, and then the ISS at the turn of the century. The International Space Station, the eighth wonder of the world. Is the ISS studio located in a NASA bunker in Houston, or is that also shot on a Nevada sound stage? Oh, it's in Houston. I've been there myself and monitored the set and the actors doing their thing. Our astronauts, Mr. Milton, they are good at their craft, are they not? They know how to keep the illusion going. Of course, them keeping a straight face is only one spoke on the wheel for this machinery. In order to convince the public that the astronauts are actually in space, everything has to work like clockwork. We use diamagnetism, vomit comets, and green screens to create a zero-gravity-like environment. And the odd good old-fashioned harness too. What kind of craft is flying up there that is being passed off as the ISS? The fact that an object the size of a football field, which the ISS is supposed to be, can be seen with the naked eye from Earth, should be an absolute impossibility. There is no way you can see an object 250 miles up in the air that small, even if it is brightly lit with the solar panels reflecting off of it. The ISS debunks itself, and you were unwise to put up a craft there in the first place. So? So what? asked Vance. What kind of aircraft is up there flying around mocked up like the ISS? Is it a high altitude plane? A spy plane? What makes you think we need an actual craft up there to pass off as the ISS, said Vance calmly with a hint of a gleam in his eye. Oh. It's a hologram. I should have known, said William. Project Blue Beam. Of course. Naturally. Yes, said Vance plainly. Thank you for confirming that. I have been wondering about it for ages. I'm sure you have. Anyway. The conspiracy theorists of yore figured out that the Apollo program, Skylab, Gemini, and Mercury, and all the rest of your phony productions were absolute garbage even 50 years ago. Horse manure is what it is. A con to make the masses believe that you are doing amazing things in space. You people are the equivalent of David Copperfield performing magic tricks, only on a larger scale. To keep the space fantasy going. How does the Earth really look like from above? Tell me. I think John and I deserve to know if you are now going to lock us up for life. It won't do any harm telling us. Think of it as another act of courtesy, as you said. A personal favor. Colin Vance spun around and looked around at his 32 companions, most of them shaking their heads. 
They don't want to show us the exact layout of the most well-kept secret in the history of man. The real map of the world. And why should they? A representative from NASA cleared his throat and rose from his chair. The man walked up to Vance and whispered something in his ear. I know who that is. That is Jim Bridenstine, administrator of NASA. Vance listened carefully to whatever Bridenstine was saying and mumbled something back. Bridenstine returned to his seat. Maliuselli. The guardsman walked up to Vance and was given instructions in what sounded like Portuguese. Maliuselli opened the door of the hearing room, only to return about 50 seconds later with a paper map. He handed the map to Vance and returned to his watchful position on the far left in the room. Obrigada, said Vance, and he rolled out the map on the table. John and William both leaned as far over the table as their handcuffs would allow. They were both chained to the underside of the granite table, but fortunately the chain stretched quite a bit. They leaned forward and finally saw what the earth really looks like. This is the last personal favor I will grant you, Mr. Milton. You traversed Antarctica and you found a landmass you were not meant to see. But there's water between Antarctica and the swath of land called Jemina on this map. How did we make it across all that water? We never swam, nor did we take a boat. We walked the entire way. John, that map clearly depicts how it's like in the summer. I think it's fair to assume that we walked over that ice, which was all covered in snow. That's why all we saw was an endless plain for so long until we reached that mountain, claimed William. John stared at the map. He noticed that it featured a third heavenly body. A black sun above the earth near the sun and the moon. Ah! The ancient Vedic, Chinese, and Maya cosmology theories were real. The black sun seems to act like Rahu in Indian mythology. A dark shadow sun that blots out the real sun, being the cause of both lunar and solar eclipses. So what's beyond Mr. Vance, said William. In for a penny, in for a pound. I have more questions. Is the earth truly an infinite plane? Is there an electromagnetic barrier at the very end of it? Is there a crystalline domed firmament above us? I have more questions. I'm sure you have questions. Thousands of them. But you'll never know the answers to them. I think. I think that I have passed along more than enough classified information to the eyes and ears of two murderers and enemies of all states in the free world. We are done here. What will happen to us? Asked John. Maliuselli. Troy. Take them away please. To the cells. Two separate cells. My father will hear of this. I think not. Off you go. They were seized by the agents and escorted out of the room, still in cuffs. They were then dragged deep down the winding staircase of the bunker. Down and down they were thrust by their captors in the catacombs below the UN headquarters. We survived the very ends of Antarctica. We fought our way through the desolate wastelands without food or water. We've been in worse pickles than this. We have to get out of here. There must be a way. There must be. There must be. A South American agent kept a harsh grip on John's forearm and ushered him further onwards, while William was dragged forward by Agent Troy. Colin Vance who preceded the procession some 20 steps behind them. Vance walked with slow, calculated steps. His handmade to stony alligator leather shoes scraped the concrete floor, producing a haunting, echoing sound through the damp halls. Vance walked like a man with utter control of the situation. They were taken deeper, ever deeper, through the granite catacombs beneath the UN building. This staircase smells of urine and cobwebs. Suddenly, they were not going deeper anymore. Maliuselli and Troy halted at the floor they were at. So, this is the floor they are going to keep us imprisoned in. As they were ushered through the damp corridors browbeaten and starved, something caught John's eye to the right of him that made his blood freeze. A marble bust depicting a writhing, demonic figure with the face of a goat. I know what that is. It is Baphomet, the satanic deity the Knights Templar were accused of worshipping in the Dark Ages. That much I know. I'm no symbologist, nor am I an expert in the Dark Arts, but I know what this means. Because it can't be a coincidence. Not after all we've been through. Not after what William showed me about their ties to the occult. These people aren't perpetrating this for the greater good of all mankind. They pay homage to something else entirely. He could see the bars from a mile away. Prison cells. They want to keep us isolated. Separated. Halt, said Vance when the procession had reached the cell meant for John. Willander. This is your new home. Get used to it. 
Agent Maliuselli opened up cell 33 with heavy iron keys and threw John in behind bars, slammed the doors shut, and locked it. The United Nations, the organization that was formed in 1945 in the backwater of World War II. A fraternity that strived for world peace, has a whole section, an entire catacomb, reserved for political prisoners and other troublemakers who pose a threat to their paradigm. My worldview. Could it be any more cynical than it is right now, in this very moment? Troy. Escort Milton to Section C please. Colin Vance, Maliuselli, Troy, and William now march gently into that dark night away from John. William? Cried John. He pushed his head between the bars, trying against all sense, to writhe himself out of his confinement. William. They were all out of sight, but he heard William's answer echoing through the prison hall. John. Do not worry. We will be all right, the both of us. We'll be all right. John thrust himself towards the bar's head first, trying to break through. All it caused him was a terrible concussion, and he wound up on the stone floor, sobbing to himself as he heard the echoing footsteps of his dear friend, and his captors slowly fade away in the catacombs. John was now trapped in an empty, desolate cell with only himself as company. And the silence. The sound of silence. The eternal sound of silence. I want my lawyer flown here, and I want him right now," shouted William while Agent Troy can find him in his cell at Section C. Vance followed Troy into the cell, still as suave as ever before. He had his arms clasped behind his back and radiated complete and utter dominance in the room. I do not demand any phone calls or anything else of that ilk. All I want is my lawyer. My family lawyer, actually, but that doesn't matter right now. Leonard Hilding, from the attorney firm Hilding, and advocate Hamgeton in central Stockholm. Hilding served us Miltons for decades. He's not a hard man to reach. You can summon him. Colin Vance pondered over his plea and finally nodded. I will grant you a lawyer. It is within your rights, after all. I'm no savage Mr. Milton. Thank you, said William gratefully. Having been through hell and high water in Antarctica, and robbed of his freedom as a result, he considered it a blessing from the skies to be able to get in touch with his attorney. I will contact their firm tonight. As you may well understand, Mr. Milton, it may take a few days until your legal counsel arrives. So, I hope that you can make yourself at home for the time being. It's not exactly a glamorous establishment this. I will concede that. But you will get used to it. I promise you, everyone does, eventually. William looked around the room. The cell was a tiny square-shaped room enclosed by white painted brick and completely lacking in otherworldly items. Not even a book was at hand. In the right-hand corner there was a sad excuse for a bed, and adjacent to it there was a tiny silvery sink. Don't worry about me, Director Vance. I'm fit as a fiddle, and a place like this might be the right medicine for my delusions of grandeur. A place to keep my feet on the ground. How quaint, said Vance. You will hear from your attorney within a short time. I always keep my word, Mr. Milton. I have no doubt that you harbor a grudge against me, and for good reason. But I am a man of my word. Sleep tight, Mr. Milton. William heard the posse marching back towards the staircase. They reached the stairs, and soon the sound of their footsteps faded away, and William's cell fell into complete and utter silence. I need to hold on now. That's all there is to make of this. Hold out a couple of days and not lose faith here in isolation. This mission of ours is still very much alive. John and I know the truth now, and for as long as we still draw breath, the status quo could still be rocked. Whatever it is we are being charged for. Murder, right. It's going to be a farce, and the verdict is already pre-decided, for sure. Making our way out of this pickle through a jury verdict is not the solution. I need Hilding for something else. All I need right now is Hilding. The days came and went in the cell. There were no visits apart from the daily food trays, which were pushed through the bars three times a day by an orderly. The food tasted about as dull and lifeless as he expected it to be. I suppose I should be grateful for these soulless meals, however. I am not freezing like I was used to. Although, it kind of evens out. No matter how bleak things were in Antarctica, we did not live in a confined space. We were free. On the third day of complete solitude, William began losing faith, and he was under-stimulated beyond words. Confined in a dark cell without windows, he feared for his sanity. He longed for something to read, or watch. The only thing he could do was to sleep, eat, and stare at the walls. And think. 
I read a study, once, about isolation. Most people become catatonic after only a day or two in isolation. Long-term confinement is a near guarantee for psychosis, and insanity would soon follow. But not for me. Hold on, William. Hold on. I am strong. I am strong. He'll come soon enough. He'll arrive precisely when he means to. He went to bed that night praying for a miracle. He'll come. On the morning of the fourth day, William jerked awake and flung to his feet as noises could be heard on the other side of the cell door. The sound of keys opening the lock of the door. William got himself dressed quickly and tried his best to look presentable. He felt weak and out of shape, but he was determined to uphold the facade in front of Vance. This isn't finished just yet. The door opened and William's heart skipped when he recognized the man he had summoned. Hope is kindled. Paul and Vance, Agent Maliuselli, and Leonard Hilding walked into the room. William laughed internally over the fact that Hilding carried the same frayed, well-worn attaché case by his side as the old man had done for decades. It wasn't just the case that warmed his heart, Leonard Hilding had not aged a day and looked precisely the same. The genial face, the portly figure, and that short white hair. The only minuscule detail that stood out has, having changed since he saw him last was that his face was more wrinkled than before, but that was to be expected. Hilding was, despite his age of 78, sharp as a needle and refused to retire from his firm, which he inherited from his father. To retire is the equivalent of tying a noose around the neck. I'd drag my ass out to the golfing course a few times a week, and in time I'd probably give golfing up entirely and hit the bottle. Waking up in the morning with no challenges ahead and no life purpose left to strive for, I'd just fade away. So I will work until the Grim Reaper himself knocks on my front door. That is what he told me when I last saw him at the Milton house. Something like that. Hilding placed his attaché case on the floor and spread his arms out. William, my boy. How in God's name did you end up here? He walked up to William and gave him a hug. I will leave you to it. You have 10 minutes, said Vance and left the room accompanied by Agent Maliuselli, who slammed the cell door shut. Long time no see, Leonard. How long exactly, do you think? Hilding scratched his forehead. Um, three years perhaps. We did celebrate Christmas together, your family and I, but that was some time ago. William sat down on his bed. That sounds about right. Listen now, Leonard. I am stuck in a most precarious situation. As you can see, I will need your aid. I was shocked to hear what you were accused of. I could hardly believe it. Good gracious William. Murder. Lies. A pack of lies, all of it. I promise. It's a rigged affair, this trial that's coming up. And you can't expect to win something that's already been pre-decided. I did not ask you to come all this way to defend me in court. Of course I will defend you. You need legal counsel, no matter what it is you have gotten yourself entangled in. And I believe you. I don't think you could harm a fly. William sighed. Leonard, it's a long long story. You wouldn't understand. All you need to know right now is that, if you care for me, and every other human being you hold dear, you're going to have to help me out in another way. I ask for you to come, because I want you to deliver a message to someone. It needs to be you Leonard. I couldn't think of anyone else who I trusted wholeheartedly, and you also happen to be a lawyer. I don't think Vance would have allowed for me to be visited by outsiders, unless they were related to my impending trial. Hilding had the look of utter confusion on his face, and his wrinkles seemed to have multiplied over the span of seconds. Um, all right William. What's the message, and to whom should I deliver it to? Pen and paper please. Hilding opened his case and dug through the contents of it. He pulled out a notebook and ripped a blank page out of it and gave William the piece of paper and a blue ink pen. William grabbed hold of the pen and began writing a name and address in Stockholm. And the letter itself. Hilding could not for the life of him understand what possibly could be so important that it had to be written down on a piece of paper for him to forward to someone else and how this letter to an unknown individual could ever help William out of his cell. William put the pen down and slowly read what he had written, and he reread it several times with the utmost concentration. When he had reread it enough and deemed it satisfactory, he put the paper down on the bed and removed the pin needle wolf head that had been pierced on his chest all this time. Hilding had not even noticed that his young protege had worn a brooch until now. The piece of paper and the brooch now rested in the palm of William's right hand, and he extended it to Hilding. 
I don't expect you to understand or make sense of this, Leonard, but maybe one day in the not too distant future you will be enlightened. It is of paramount importance that this piece of paper and this brooch will safely arrive to the person intended. Of utmost importance, I cannot stress it enough Leonard. I will see it through, my boy. I don't know what all of this means, but I will see it through. I promise. William leaned towards Hilding and gave him the paper and the pin needle, and he put his trembling hand on the old man's frail shoulders. The future of the world is at stake, whispered William. Epilogue The month of June was upon them, and at last Stockholm was a hospitable place on earth again. Professor Celeste Wood deemed the climate during wintertime tolerable at best, but right here and now all was forgotten. We do have our fair share of murderous winters even back in Boston, but they were shorter and milder. Maybe. Maybe it's time for me to move home soon. Move home for real. Leave and say au revoir to the socialist tundra. Say fare thee well to their weird cuisine, the snus and their sir strumming, and God knows what additional devilry they've got going for them that I have not yet tried, nor ever will I. But then came May and washed the slosh away from the streets, and the city was brought to life again. The area surrounding the Royal Institute of Technology happened to be one of her favorite strolls during the few hours she could spare in between classes and lectures. The lush and verdant Little Jan Forest, which connects the university grounds to Stockholm Stadium, was a wonderful place this time of year, and she tried to walk there as often as she could. Eleven lectures in total next week at the auditorium. Three on Wednesday. Four on Thursday. Will they ever leave me in peace? She sat in her study plowing through internet memos and looking over next week's schedule. I need to get out of here already. It's Thursday and 6 o'clock. What am I even doing here? I should be in my couch at home with a generous glass of Rioja in front of me and fall asleep to some movie on Netflix. Good gracious. She made herself ready to leave and packed up her laptop and went for her coat when there was a knock on the door. Come in, said Celeste gently. Pardon me Dr. Wood. Her assistant, the young and lively Julia Langdon, pranced into her room carrying a package. This arrived earlier today. I was just on my way out and nearly forgot to give it to you. In any case, I will be going home for the night, if that's all right with you. Clocking out. I only work till 5.45 on Thursdays, as you know. Celeste looked at the large clock in her study, which showed 6.10. Oh, but of course. Of course you should go home, you shouldn't have to work overtime. Go now, off you go. And thanks for the package. Do you know who sent it? Julia shrugged. No idea. It arrived in the morning, and I didn't see who delivered it. There's no sender on the label. All right, Julia. Good night with you. Good night. Celeste put her coat back on the hanger and held the package in front of her with both hands. There was a logo type depicting a falcon clutching a fish in the bottom right corner with the text Hilding and Aldvik written in red above it. Hilding and Aldvik, the attorney firm at Hamgeton. What do they want from me? Her name was written in hand on the middle of the package along with the address, Dr. Celeste Judith Wood. Judith. Judith. Nobody's referred to me as Judith for 15 years or the like. Not even my professional colleagues call me by that name. Not even on formal occasions. She unwrapped the parcel slowly and poured its contents out on the desk. Two items fell out of it. A silver brooch and a white scroll. She went for the scroll first and unrolled the piece of paper. Just like the text on the parcel it came with, the note was written by hand. Dr. Wood. Professor Wood. Celeste. It's been a long time since we met in person, and even longer since our regular correspondence over the internet. I don't have time to be long-winded, so I'll keep this as brief as possible, as time is a luxury that I do not possess. I am being imprisoned in New York, and my future looks bleak to say the least. There's a chance that I will never see the light of day again. It's a very long story. The item I sent you will explain what I have been up to the past couple of months, along with my partner John. A picture says more than a thousand words, they say. Well, a video should speak even louder. Celeste. We found it. We journeyed to Antarctica and beyond. To a Munson Scott and further down the road. We walked, we walked, we walked. And eventually we found it. We found absolute proof of what they are hiding down there. We saw with our own eyes, but a sliver of the landmass being hidden from the general public's unknowing eyes. We saw the tip of the iceberg, and God knows what else lies beyond where we walked. 
You need to do something for me now. You need to play the video, and let it sink in. And then, you will have to act. For my sake, for John's sake, for your sake, and for the sake of the free world. If we are to break free from this tyrannical cabal, that rules the world from the shadows, the video needs to be released, and spread before their draconical endgame will be upon us all. The most ambitious false flag event of all time is coming, and it's coming sooner than you think. They intend to unleash their staged alien invasion. If they succeed, the world will never be the same again. Send it to all corners. Send it to mass media, alternative media, every newspaper, television channel, and every authority you can think of. Send it to everyone. From the moment the video's gone viral, the world will be changed. Forever. There is no going back. Will this lead to total chaos on a biblical scale across all nations, or will it lead to something good? I hope and believe in the latter. The truth will out. Change the world for me, Celeste. William Melton, May 29, 2020. The 29th. That was just six days ago. Is this a joke? I had almost forgot. Almost. It's been a long time since the encounter with him and his green friend. Now it all washes over me like a tsunami. Did I inspire them to do something hasty? Reckless. She placed the scroll on the desk and began examining the pin needle, like instructed. She held the wolf head brooch in her palm and shined a light on it to see what could possibly be of interest with a metal trinket. On the front side, there was nothing unusual. A perfectly regular pin needle made in silver stainless steel with the figure of a wolf. She flipped it around and shined the lamp on the underside. Oh my god. That black spot on the front side that is supposed to be eye of the wolf in profile. It's a micro camera. On the back side of the brooch she discerned two words, Lockheed Martin. The micro camera was wired to a tiny USB memory stick. It's one of those mini USBs. How clever. What on earth is stored on this little device? She grabbed the USB and plugged it into her laptop. The device showed up on the computer and she clicked to reveal its contents. One file. That's all there is. An MP4 file. A large one. It's the video. She drew five deep breaths, launched the video in VLC media player and pressed play. She saw them walk in Antarctica during daylight. She saw them walking in Antarctica at night with torches in their hands. She saw them climbing and reaching the summit of a great mountain. She saw them gazing out from the peak of the mountain over the view. A large rain forest. She saw them walk through the forest and be captured by military police. She saw the hearing in New York. She saw John be thrown into a cell, screaming his lungs out for William. And she saw William being locked up himself in a highly protected cell. The clip ended. She sat for a long while just staring at the screen. The magnitude of what I just saw. It will take time to process. We were right, and now it is confirmed beyond a shadow of doubt. What was shown on the video could not be argued against. The director of the Security Council of the United Nations, Colin Vance, he unknowingly admitted everything. And the man next to him was that Jim Bridenstine. She removed the USB stick from the computer and looked at the tiny thing. Imagine that something so minuscule like this little gadget could make the difference that shapes the future of mankind and the balls in my court now, to mold the future which way I wanted to. Worldwide chaos. Crisis of faith. Anarchy. Death and destruction. Absolute turmoil will await, should I go through with this, I am not naive enough to tell myself otherwise. I either go through with it, or I go the other way. I destroy this memory stick right now, thus allowing the status quo paradigm to continue. The world will continue spinning on an imaginary ball as the sleepwalkers and sheep carry on with their day for all time to come. Who am I really, to wake people up? Who am I to stir the pot? She weighed the options for about five minutes. And then she knew what to do. Every fiber of my body screams. Screams that I ought to do this. Need to do this. She plugged the USB stick into her laptop once again. June 4, 2020, will go down in the history books as the day when the veil disguising the greatest lie in human history is lifted and its true colors revealed. To break a curse you need to fight it down to the bone and marrow. Remove it altogether, root and stem. To lift a curse, you need a ruthless and powerful wand to wave. I choose panic, death, anarchy, and destruction. Chaos in its purest form. Total chaos because it is the sensible thing to do in an insensible situation. 
She gazed at the painting of Sir Isaac Newton hanging on the wall over the bookcase. She reached for the fruit bowl on the desk and grabbed a hold of a very particular green fruit. As she took her very first bite of the apple, one of the windows in her study suddenly flew open. A gust of wind blew through the room and knocked over a large object in front of her. The frayed globe on her desk wobbled around and fell hard to the ground, shattering into a thousand pieces.